How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit different kind of sermon today. Um, for since I graduated, I've been invited to preach here. Um, I'm the evangelism guy at our convention and the missions guy, and I'm, I'm always I've always been. Um, challenged by God to challenge you to declare the gospel and preach on evangelism. Um, but today I'm going to preach a little bit about something different. Um, I want to, God put in my heart to speak on how to love one another um, in order to, of course, love the world and bring this message to them. Um, and the other reason I just want to ask you for forgiveness, if I break down at any moment, because my mom passed away on September 16. And when she told my sister, I'm tired, I've been in the hospital for three months, tonight I'm going to ask the Lord to take me home. And I told my sister, Andrea, you know, let's, I'm going to go look for tickets and try to be there by Friday. She goes, Cesar, what are you saying? And I go, I don't know. You know how mom is. When she says something, it's done. And the earliest flight I got was on Friday, and I wanted to make it there to say bye, and, but I was 30 minutes late. But I didn't feel bad about it because three weeks prior I was there, and I spent the whole two whole days at the hospital with her, joking around and talking, and I filmed her. I asked her to give advice to her grandchildren, to me, to, to her friends, to my dad, and I have a lot of videos of her. Um, I asked her, Mom, is there anything you want? You always gave me everything I wanted. And she said, yeah, but they won't give it to me. I go, what, what, what do you mean? I've been asking for watermelon, but they don't give me watermelon because I have diabetes and I'm sick and my liver's gone and my kidneys are bad and they're saying, you can't eat watermelon. I go, well, you're gonna eat watermelon today. So I went across the street and I bought a, wa a watermelon and I went to the dollar store. I go, what am I gonna cut the watermelon with? So I bought a knife at the dollar store, but you know, in, in, in all the hurrying and, and everything I was going through, I totally forgot I'm holding a knife in my hand and, and I'm in Toronto. <laughs> and I'm going to, through Credit Valley Hospital. I put my mask on to top it off. I'm wearing a mask. And, and the security stops me and he says, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I, uh, listen, man, my mom wants watermelon. She's dying and I, I got to give her this. But what's the knife for? Well, to cut the watermelon. So... <laughs> <laughs> the man was Arabic and he goes, are you crazy bringing a, a watermelon and a knife in your hand? What's wrong with you? I go, listen, my mom's dying. What would you do? He goes, okay, put the knife in your pocket and go in. <laughs> so, you know, we, we had a lot of fun eating the watermelon and joking around and remembering things. And as I, as I looked at this sermon, I, there's no way I can think about love without my mom. She, and, you know, as soon as I got to the hospital, I, I had to go on pastor mode because my sister was there, family was there, and I had to pray and I had to read verses. Mary was with me. She had to sing, you know, her. and um, so I had to be strong and I had to prepare everything, the bulletin and the music, and I had to read her will and see what she wanted. And I just didn't have time to really reflect and think about, you know, mom is gone. Until I got back. So these, these few weeks has been crazy because I remember her and I, and I, 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 I forget she's gone. I go, I got to call mom, see how she's doing. And I go, my mom's gone. But I want you to, to read this text and, and really listen to it. And it's a text that you've all read and you probably know off by heart. 
It's a text that we all use when we get married or we talk about love, but, but, but let's really analyze what the, the text mean, means and, 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 and what it's saying. And it's in 1 Corinthians 13, that famous love text. I have the, the NIV. Don't criticize me if you don't like it. <laughs> um, and look what it says from verses 1 to... Let's read until 11. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but I have no love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love. I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have no love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in, with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put selfish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remains, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. What is love when you think of it? There are different kinds of love. The Bible talks about it. We have Greek words that describe it. And are we loving one another the way that Jesus loves us? Does Jesus' love compels us in a way that wherever we walk, we see lostness? Does his love compels us in a way that if our children need us, we are there for them no matter what? We live in a world that thinks and knows what love is. To some, love is conditional. If you show me love, then I will love you. Others think that love is when people fulfill their needs. If you fulfill what I need, then I'll start loving you. And we see this all around us. We see it in movies. We see it in the media. We see it in politics. We see it with our friends at work. We see it at our schools. According to many movements, love is letting people be whatever they want to be or letting people do whatever they want to do. And that is why our world is confused in lies, confused about who they are, about what is family, what is marriage. Because they, they assume they know what love is. Some young couples think that love is 50-50. My mom said something to me about that one. We have lost our purpose as man and woman, as husband, wife, as a mother, as a father, because we have forgotten the role that God has given us in his love. And if we don't start loving one another, loving everyone, how are we going to love a lost world? On September 16, mom went to be with the Lord. She used to get angry when she heard these things, and she would get angry when she would hear everything that's happening. When I was there those two days, she said, Caesar, love Mary as Jesus loved the church, and be willing to die for her. I'm going, no, mom. Be faithful to the end. I know, mom, okay. You know, she will get angry about these things. And I hope and I pray that I will to the end. 
Be a man 100%, she said. Not 50%. Provide for your family and be an example and manage your home as a man 100%. Not 50%. You be a man and let Mary be a woman and you guys love each other 100%. The roles doesn't matter and that's where this world is confused. And I go, mom, you're pretty wise. After God, your family is the most important. If we can manage our home, men, young men, or are going to get married or are married, how are we going to serve the Lord? And this is something that as men we need to really think about who we are. We should be that example in the home. As I prepared and I preached in the library in Toronto. I had to go to a library to prepare the sermon because I had no time. And I prepared the sermon for my mom about two hours before the service. I just didn't have time. Everything happened so fast. And as I was there in the library, I kept crying when I'm preparing the sermon. And this lady came to me, are you okay, young man? And I go, no, I'm fine. I just, I'm preparing. What are you doing? I'm preparing a sermon because my mom passed away last night. And she said, wow, oh, wow. Uh, okay, I hope you do well. <laughs> I go, I will try. Why do people have the wrong ideology of what is love? Because their source is the world. And the one who controls his world is Satan. Stop asking people how to love. Open the Bible and find out how to love. Stop asking people what to do. Go to the Bible and he'll tell you what to do. Because sometimes we get so much information and so much different opinions. We drift away from what the truth is. And I'm telling you because it happens sometimes even as Christians. Where does your source come from? Who is your source when it comes to love? To loving one another? And when God says to love one another, your first one another is your spouse and your children and your family. Those are your first one another. They, they live at your home. They, you married them. You, you, you raised them. They're your first one another. Then your brothers and sisters, we, here, right now. And then lostness. So if we skip over family and we skip over one another, how are we going to love them? It is an impossibility. But sometimes we do that. As pastors, we forget our children. When they need us, we forget to ask, how are you doing? And I confess, I travel a lot and sometimes I forget. And I realize when I sit down with my son, I say, how are you doing? And wow, I hear all these things. Oh, wow, a lot is going on. Time flies. 50 came to me very fast. My daughter is on her second year of university. I'm like, what? I bought her a car, and for the first time, I'm not driving her anymore. And I'm like, wow, my daughter, goodbye. I'm like, wow, she's okay. I'm not there to protect her no more. My son is taller than I am, and he's teaching me things. My little one, Dave, you know, Sammy, he, he said, Dad, I'm praying for you. You know, you're okay. Just just breathe and you can do this. You, you always preach. You know, and he's encouraging me before I go up to preach on my mom's funeral. And I'm like, who is this kid? How did they grow up so fast? Really think about how you're loving your family. There comes a day that you can't call mom no more. And I sucked at that sometimes. <laughs> I took so long to call her, sometimes two weeks, and she will phone me. Caesar, you haven't called me for two weeks. I go, I'm sorry, Mom. It's just, but was I that busy? Sometimes you won't hear Dad's voice no more. You will leave here from the seminary, and you won't see these seminary students no more. Now, were you here just studying, or were you here also building relationships, building memories, and networking together? Because these are the memories and the, and the things that you will never forget. Are you loving the way God loves you? And who is your source? 
in 1 John in the first part. In 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. So if you are loving, you are listening and you are doing what God is. God is love, the true love. The first part of 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God. Love the way he loves. And if we know God and we say we believe in Jesus, are we loving like him? All the time. I confess, I'm not. Do we put an X on people? I remember when I was pastoring in Toronto, someone came up to me and says, uh, uh, Caesar, can I grab more chairs to put on the right? And I said, why? There's more chairs there. Yeah, but that person's sitting there. I don't want to sit over there. At first, you kind of think it's funny, but it's not. And we are called to make disciples. We can't even be in a room of someone you don't like. Did you put an X on anyone? Do you love all your family members, even if they hurt you? Because it's easy to love those who love you. It was easy for me to love my mom because she was my number one fan. When I went to see her, she goes, oh, you're so handsome. I go, mom, look at my belly. I'm getting gray hair. Am I losing my hair? What are you talking about? To mom, I was always good looking. To mom, you know, she loved my sermons. Yes, our moms, most moms, will be like that. That was easy to love, but some moms will not. Some moms will walk away. Some moms will not love you how you want them to love you. And at that funeral, that was the case of one person that was sitting there. It was my brother, Tony. You see, when I was those two days with my mom, we talked about a lot of things. And I said, Mom, I never asked you this, but I know, Caesar. Yes, I know the Lord's going to take me. Don't start crying. I go, but just how many, how many times was Dad unfaithful to you that you know of? She goes, about 33 times. God, you forgave him that many times? She said, yeah. And you still love the guy? She goes, yeah. I'm so sorry. She says, don't be sorry. Look at the son God gave me. Look at the daughter I have, the grandchildren. Look where I'm going. It's funny that the last thing I heard her say when I left, she said, take care of your dad because you know him. He's going to be hurt. I go, even now you still think you're worried about dad? He came to visit you two weeks ago with another woman? But that was mom, unconditional love. So in that church, there was Tony, my brother, who, when we came to Canada after a year, they were here, we were here. My dad took off with this young Italian girl to Vancouver. Didn't see him for three years. He comes back with this kid. She gives me $20 and tells me, it's your brother's birthday, is going to be one, so you have to go meet him. And of course, I was angry. I said, I'm not going to go meet that kid. He's not my brother. Yes, he is. It's not his fault what happened. So I got him a soccer ball. And when I went and the door opened, my dad goes, hey, Caesar, I threw the ball. And he headed back. He went, Poof. and I go, hey. <laughs> Since that day, we became so close. I was his coach for five years. And Tony and R, if you look at us, our relationship was like, we're, we're, we're from the same mother, but we're not. So Tony comes up because he has to speak, and he said, when my mother left, when I had no one, the woman who took Janice husband away raised me. When I needed a mother, she was there. In her will, we started crying because in her will, she listed her children, and I took a picture and sent it to Tony. He goes, Tony, look what mom wrote. He said, Caesar Para, Andrea Para, and Tony Para. She put Tony in her will. Unconditional love. Mom taught me how to love. And when she found Jesus, I realized, and she must have realized, that a lot of the things she did without him, she was already being obedient to him. How important it is to love like Jesus loves. 
Paul is writing to the church in this text, reminding of the importance of love in order to keep the unity in the church. But in reality, our first church is our family. We got to do everything to keep the unity in the family. We got to do everything to keep the unity in the church so we can be the salt that purifies in this world and we can be the light where there's darkness. And that light comes from how we love one another and express this love that God gives us. Jesus also emphasized this. And Paul says we are a body of Christ with different parts, with different spiritual gifts. In chapter 12, verses 27 to 28, says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all the apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. We all have different gifts through the Holy Spirit. But the greatest gift and the most important gift and the greatest thing above all these things is how we love. You can become great preachers here, great theologians, teachers. But if everyone remember, remembers you of someone that was cruel, <laughs> rude, doesn't mean anything. You've gained nothing. This November 22nd, it's 20 years since I've been a pastor. I was ordained. I have many cards from Toronto's churches that we planted from here, from Spain. And if I show you all those cards, I have this thing that, you know, those, those cylinders that play music, that pathway gave me, and people wrote on it when we left. From all those things that people write, never anyone ever said, I liked your sermons. Thank you for the theology you taught me. You know the things they will list? Thank you for helping us move. Thank you, Pastor, that that day I called you at 3 o'clock in the morning. You got up and came to my house. I had a young man in Spain that used to get bullied. And I said, I'm going to go with you. He goes, you're going to stick up for me? I go, no, I'll just stand by you for a week. And when they ask you who I am, don't tell them. Just say, it's none of your business. So I went there with sunglasses, and I just stood there. For a week, they never touched him again. He goes, how did you know they would stop? I go, well, my face, this, this is my face, man. God gifted me with his face that I don't need to fight. I just show it. <laughs> so don't fight. It's not good for you. But he was so happy that I went with him. Those are the things that people will remember. How you treat them, how you love them, how you speak to them, how you forgive them. Those are the things that make an impact in this world. Jesus also emphasizes unity in the church to build up the church in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity and in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, maintaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is what Paul is trying to teach, to teach us. There's a lot of things that you will learn in seminary and with North American Mission Board, with IMB, with the convention, with our brothers, with teachers. A lot of things, a lot of good stuff. But if you have all the knowledge, you have your 4.0 GPA, but you do not have love for people, You've gained nothing. And we see this among us. Many of us blossom these gifts and begin to be somebody who serves Jesus effectively in this world. But look at verse 1 and 3 of chapter 13. If I speak in tongues of men, of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong. If I have the gift of prophecy and I phantom all the mysteries of all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have 
not love, I am nothing. My question to you today, are you loving people the way God loves you? And that's the hardest thing to do. When we become great teachers, it's easy to teach. It's in you. God gave you that. When you preach, yeah, I can preach. That's what I was able to preach at my mom's funeral. You know, I got strength, but the, the experience, yeah, I can do it. But do we really, did I really love my mother? I felt bad that I didn't make it. But when I had to clear, that's another thing I had to do during that week. Clear her apartment with my sister. And as we're putting everything away and throwing stuff out, she had so much stuff. There was a little box of all her devotional little books. And then and, and, and I opened the book and I'm reading 1995 when I came to know Christ. And, and in one of those days she wrote, thank you, Lord, for the obedient son you gave me. That when I told him to go to church, he was obedient. Are you obedient to God? Are you obedient to your parents? Because if you honor your mother and father, the Bible says, your life will go well. No matter who they are. No matter what they did. What is God trying to tell us today? We must love like Jesus. How do we love? And then it explains this chapter 13. Love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Sometimes knowledge can make us proud. Make sure that after you get your MDiv or whatever you get here, you don't go to churches being proud because you know more. Be humble. It always amazed, it may, it, you know, I was always amazed how Dr. Kaba, I know theology professor here, the whole summer he was working outside with his shovel and, and he was always so humble in how he talked to us, how we knew more. <laughs> Don't let knowledge take away your humbleness. Don't let your experience take away your humbleness. Because if we we're going to build the next generation, you're going to have to let them lead no matter how good you are. And if they fail, they fail. Give them a chance. That's why I'm here. People always gave me a chance. Paul Johnson always took me under his wing, and I messed up lots of times. Love is patient. Love is kind. Be patient with your family. I was patient with my father. It was hard to forgive him. But he's the first one I share the gospel with. My mom always said, you know, your dad didn't know the Lord. I go, I know, mom, but he did a lot. <laughs> because of her faith and her love, I came to know Christ. My sister, my brother Tony, family in Chile, my dad, friends. And at her funeral, old friends that were atheists that came there, they received Christ that day. My best friend Giovanni, who, who always said no to Jesus, said, so now what? I got to quit drinking, Caesar? I go, what are you talking about? I received Christ with you, man, today. I go, bro, wow, it took you 25 years. <laughs> it is our love for others that God builds relationship and breaks those bonds. It is not rude. Love is not rude or self-seeking. We always want what we want, don't we? What is important to us. Just remember that love is not self-seeking. I decided to marry my wife because I, I always told my mom, I want a wife like you, mom, but you can't find that anymore. She goes, that's because you're looking in the wrong place. You're going to those salsa things and, and clubs and bars. Of course, you're, you're suffering. Come to church. She used that to bring me to church, you know. But after three years of going to Mary's house every Thursday from 6 to 9, that was when I was allowed to see her at her house. The first date we had, we we're so excited. Her, you know, our parents let us go on our first date. And I'm not saying this to criticize my, my mother and my father-in-law because they were right. I was eight years older. And I had a rough life. 
And they knew who Caesar Parra was. So it was okay with me. And the reason why I was okay with because I really loved her. I would do anything for that woman. And if I had to see her from six to nine, so be it. But you know when I really decided this is my wife, that on our first date, you know, we're getting ready to leave. I'm dressed up. Imagine how excited we were that, wow. And her mom said, yeah, but you got to go by bus. You can't go in your car. And you got to be home before the sun goes down. I felt like I was in the old age looking at the sun to see what time it is. So I'm about to leave, we're sitting down, and my brother phones me, and my brother Tony, we, you know, he was growing up, and he was kind of acting weird, and I haven't seen him for a long time, and I was sad about that. And he says, hey, bro, I have two tickets to see the Toronto Maple Leafs. For when? For now, for tonight. You want to go? And I go, oh, no. Caesar, is that Tony? I go, yeah. It's okay, Mary, don't worry. No, what is it? Wow, it's good. He called you. We've been praying for him. What does he want? I go, no, it's right. What does he want, Caesar? It's okay, I I have tough to do tonight. You know, we're going on our first date. She goes, no, no, no. What does he want? He has tickets to see the Leafs. She takes off her jacket and she goes, you're going with your brother. Because we can go on a date anytime. Your relationship with your brother, it's more important. Love is not self-seeking. And I said to myself, I'm marrying this one. (laughs) She's going to be my wife. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. 33 times my dad cheated on my mom. Raised the son that she left, that mother she left, took her husband away, she raised her son. She didn't keep record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Our spiritual maturity is shown in our actions. Throughout scripture, love is an action. It is an unconditional commitment. First to God, when we choose to follow Christ in conversion, we begin to love God with all our hearts. And if we love God with all our hearts, we will love one another with all our hearts. And if we don't and we're not capable of doing that, you must really ask yourself, Did you truly repent and truly receive Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior? Or did you just receive him as your Savior? Because when he's your Lord, you will love one another no matter what happens. That is what Christ is trying to tell us today. This is what love is. When we choose to love, it is a covenant that life conditions will not break. It is an unconditional love, agape, love that can be revealed in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Only by his love that he made complete in us, we can truly love one another. Mom laid down her life for us. Always chose us first. Never left us, never abandoned us always gave us what was was good for us. I remember she saved money one time, I didn't even know, for two years, and she took us to France. A single mother working in a factory. She took Andrea and I to France. People in the hood started saying that we were drug dealers. (laughs) That was mom. My question to you today, are you loving like Jesus loves? A love for one another will encourage others to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit will work through our lives and be an example to others. That is what God is telling us today. 1 John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. And that is a harsh closing statement that I'm saying. I want to say sorry to any of you if I ever offended you or if I hurt you. Because if I did, I'm a liar of the gospel I preach every week. And every day we got to ask ourselves, are we loving our wife, our husband, our children, our one another's in this world the way Jesus loves us? Am I doing what Jesus wants me to do? Christ is the prime example of love. 
This is how we know that what God love, what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we are to lay down our lives for our brothers. 1 John 3.16 So are you laying down your life for one another? Is there anyone here that you don't like very much for whatever difference you may have? Are you having problems loving your roommate? Because let me tell you, if you can't love your roommate in seminary while you study his word, how are you going to love a world that criticizes you and spits at you and, and, and calls your names? And, and man, the things you hear when you're a pastor, let me tell you, you will hear those of you who will become that. Love one another. The way we love others is the gospel in action. It's not enough to preach it. You must live it in order to preach it. And that means you have to repent every day of your sins and your mistakes. And ask God to renew you, to cleanse you from head to toe with his grace and his love. You must be obedient to the Holy Spirit that is in you when it tells you, what are you doing? You must be willing to shut up when the Holy Spirit said, don't say nothing, Caesar. Shut up and listen. You must be willing to love others. That is what God is trying to teach us today. In order to preach the gospel, we must love one another and live it first. Amen? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today, for your word. Because it is your word that is truth. And love comes from you, Lord. And it's revealed to us as an instruction, as a blueprint for our lives. And how we must love one another. So, Lord, I, I pray for us today. That we may be that example in how we love. And how we forgive. And how we are patient. Help us, Lord, be, not be proud of who we are. Help us, Lord, not keep a record of wrong on people. Help us have your grace and your unconditional love that surpasses everything. So that we as a seminary, as a school, as a body of Christ can take this love to difficult places where people don't know how to love. Because, Lord, I know, we know, it is with this that you will open up the doors, that you will build bridges so that everyone can come to know you personally and love like never before. So, Lord, help us confess what we're doing wrong and help us do what we should do in your eyes and your presence. So we can love people the way you love them. In your name we pray. Amen.